This is a Dude Studios production. And hey, I'm the dude. Mint Mobile has reimagined the wireless shopping experience and made it way easier. There's no stores, no salespeople, no nonsense. Just a huge savings on the nation's largest, most reliable 5G network. With plans as low as $15 a month, you have unlimited talk, unlimited text, and you can find the perfect data plan that suits you. You can even bring your old phone if you're still used to it. Or if you want to get rid of your old phone and upgrade, Mint Mobile has a large selection of phones for you to choose from. Just follow the link for Mint Mobile in the description of this podcast. Check out the plans and the opportunities for you to save some money with your new wireless service. Go to mintmobile.com today. Hi, this is Bobby Jean Daniel from Double Down Saloon. You are listening to Hey Bartender Podcast with Anthony, the Jews, the King Dingaling. And I want to send out a quick shout out to uh, my buddy Boogie Liv, who is uh, responsible for this meeting. Boogie Liv, love you. See you soon. I got your beer and your shot ready, my friend. Hey, bartender. Times have been interesting. My last shift was uh, better than John Wayne Gacy's crawl space, but uh, <laughs> that's about to change because we are getting into the busy season. <laughs> oh, that's good. Well, uh, I suppose let's just uh, get things started here. So welcome to Hey Bartender Podcast. Uh, thank you so much for uh, supporting and uh, following Hey Bartender Podcast and uh, reaching out to me. Uh, I re- uh, really appreciate that. Well, and thank you for having me. I am so stoked to be here. I'm so excited. Yeah. <laughs> and I was checking out your uh, YouTube uh, series this afternoon. I finally got around to that, and that's a lot of fun, too. Yes. I'm As having... somebody who has supposedly worked at haunted bars, I can appreciate it. So. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm having a lo- uh, real good time researching these uh, restaurants and bars, and uh, yeah. just now, I'm getting people to uh, actually submit their uh, their stories, and that's really fun for me too. Yeah, that's exciting. I'm so glad. So and so, it's so fun to see you branch out. Yeah, that's uh, scary for me. <laughs> <laughs> but you're kicking ass. Do it. <laughs> Thank you so much. So uh, why don't we start off by you introducing yourself? My name's Bobby Jean Daniel. I uh, bartend at the Double Down Saloon, New York City, home of the world famous Ass Juice. That's yes, our one and only specialty drink. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, and what I mean by world famous is like, you know, it's, it's Hugo de Culo in Spanish. It's a jus de derriere in French. Oh, it's, okay. uh, yeah. Like, you know, you know, it's world famous. Like people <laughs> love our shit. Yeah. Definitely. Um, uh, well, uh, so you're out in New York. Uh, uh, what's, uh, how's things going out there right now? I uh, think it's going pretty well. Like uh, things are starting to come back to life. Um, people are really genuinely enjoying uh, reconnecting. Um, there's a real sort of almost a celebratory air. I, uh, people are still being cautious. We're checking vaccines and, and all of that. But um, I think, you know, I, I like to remind people, don't forget, the Roaring Twenties also happened right after a plague. Right. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. That's excellent point. <laughs> <laughs> so it's uh, it's been pretty busy and it's been getting busier. And I'm really uh, lucky where I am because I work what's not even like the busiest nights of the week. Um, but I have so many industry people come through ah, and so yeah. many tourists come through as well. So for somebody who works like the off nights, like I'm, I'm, I'm taken very well care of by my, my regulars and my randoms. That's good. <laughs> so, so, yeah, it rocks to be me. <laughs> so, like I uh, like I told you before, I like to start off this, with the show with my guests telling uh, telling us a drink special. So, yes. what do you have for us today? Well, I have the Jonestown Kool Aid. Jonestown, which Kool-Aid. I came up with. Yes, I uh, came with that one day when um, I decided that it was uh, it was a quiet day at work, and I decided that it was better than Jonestown. <laughs> yeah. So. So I was, I came up with the Jonestown Kool-Aid and uh, what it is and uh, what's great about it is uh, it's best done as a shot. You can do it as a drink 
but I like to do it as a shot because it's got that whole, you know, mass suicide uh, sort of uh, uh, vibe to it when you do it like that. Mm -hmm. um, I wish I did have the little plastic cups that work because it would be funner to do it that way. Um, but what it is, is it's pomegranate liqueur. And what you do is uh, equal parts that and equal parts uh, uh, amaretto. Mm. All right. And what I mean by equal parts is you've got to determine it based on how many people are doing the shot. Mm. So your standard shot is, say, an ounce. So you've got two people doing the shot. Then what you'll do is like one ounce of each. And then you top it off with a sour mix. Then you shake it like a baby. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like a baby. And then you, you pour it in the shot glasses and, and light it up for however many people are having them. If it's three people, I'll do an ounce and a half. Mm of the pomegranate liqueur and an ounce and a half of the amaretto and then top it off with the, uh, with the uh, uh, sour mix. So it depends on how many people are doing the shot. But what's great is it's adjustable like that. It's like a, like a green tea shot. When people are doing the green tea shot, you could just kind of adjust based on how many people are doing it. So Yeah. That's uh, the Jonestown Kool-Aid. That's the one that's better than Jonestown. <laughs> uh, is it uh, really popular? People, uh, people, are you known for that? I'm not really known for that because I work at a place that's known for the ash juice. Mm. And, uh, and we don't really have pomegranate liqueur there. But what I do like to use is we do have a little bit of pomegranate grenadine. So I'll use vodka and then a little bit of the pomegranate grenadine to give it that kind of bit sweetness and then the amaretto and then the sour mix. But we're known for the ash juice. Yeah. Yeah. So that's Hugo de Culo. <laughs> He's a dead ear. That's what so, we do. So More ash juice than a cholera outbreak. <laughs> that's cool um so why don't uh let's start at the beginning we don't we're not going to go all the way back to birth but uh you said you've been a bartender for 25 years uh when actually that... if we're being honest i've been a bartender <laughs> for 44 years because 44. i come from an alcoholic family ah well professionally right. <laughs> <laughs> no but this is a good story right uh, so uh, i'd be sitting in the back of the van as we did in the 70s on grandpa cooler and he had such road rage that he needed like a PBR or two mm. just to keep him from like jumping out of his vehicle and beating up some poor innocent person who might have forgotten to put on their blinker. So mm. it started with that, with grandpa and me just wanting him to be a nicer person for the world. And, you know, he also was giving me a ride and he told me to hand him a damn beer. Um, <laughs> and then that led to how I learned about Texas recycling because I grew up in Texas. Mm. Right. We're about some Texas. And you know what Texas recycling is. I grew up kind of all over, but I spent a fair amount of time in East Texas. Mm. And then uh, my favorite part of Texas was uh, down in the Corpus Christi area. I've been there. So good yeah. fishing, good people, just like a really, really, I liked it better than East Texas. There were a lot of fire ants and angry people in East Texas. Uh, I live in, uh, <laughs> oh. as of right now, I'm originally from Oregon, but I live in East Texas, or West Texas right now. West Texas, yeah. And that's, uh, you know, a whole lot of nothing. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's definitely a different thing than East Texas. Like, people try to get me to explain Texas to them, and I'm like, you have no idea. Texas is vast. Mm -hmm. West Texas is way different than East Texas. is way different than Central Texas. It's way different than the Dallas area. I mean, it's really, it's a very, very interesting, different kind of place, for mm -hmm. sure. But Texas recycling, right, is you drink the beer, you set it up on a, on a stump, and then you shoot the beer can. Yes. Yes. <laughs> that's Texas recycling. I've seen the uh, aftermath of that many times. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's Texas recycling. Uh, and then uh, uh, professionally, though, I, uh, I worked at a restaurant and I was considered one of their fastest waitresses. And uh, they wanted me to be management. The problem is, is the management shift was $100 a shift. But as a waitress, I'd make between 100 and 150 Right. And then as a waitress, I could just walk out and not worry about what other people are doing. Mm -hmm. And as a manager, I would not have that luxury. So I told them they had a, a, a bartending shift open up. And I said, how about this? You give me that shift, train me to bartend, and I'll train all of your new wait staff. Because they really, I was really good at training people. I was really good at like, you know, noticing what was going to, you know, the, the questions they were going to have before they had them. Sure you know, troubleshooting things before they got there. So, uh, so that's how I got started at a, at a little place uh, in East Village called Around the Clock, where I met Ethan Hawk. I waited on him there. Oh, wow. Uh -huh. and I met Uma Thurman there. Were they still together at the time? 
they were together at the time, mm. uh, but they weren't together when I met them. They were there separately. Ah. He came in for the chicken piccata and uh, he tipped, uh, I remember, and he tipped us. Uh, nine dollars on his eleven dollar tab and he was totally low maintenance and just a really nice chill dude um uma thurman turned me into a geeky drooling 14 year old boy <laughs> really i thought i was about as heterosexual as you could get until i saw her in the movie henry and june yeah and then i thought okay maybe not so straight after all <laughs> <laughs> maybe i'm questioning here so uh, when I met her, I was just like wiping my, the drool off my chin, reaching out. I was like, oh, wait, not this hand. And then I swapped hands and wiped, you know, shook her hand with the non-drool hand. <laughs> and I was, I was ridiculous. But uh, it was also I met uh, uh, Joey Ramone there. Oh, cool. Well, I didn't really meet him because he didn't talk to me. Yeah. Joey Ramone is famously extremely shy. Right. And, uh, and when I went to his table, it was him and a friend of his, and they ordered two glasses of water, and they ordered uh, a pasta salad. Mm. And uh, Joey didn't talk to me. All I heard was a pasta salad. So I brought <laughs> out two glasses of water and a pasta salad to the guy who talked to me. And Joey's kind of sitting there. And Joey's skinny, man. I didn't even think he ate, to tell you the truth. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh. Like. It wouldn't have surprised me if he was just going to sit there and drink water and watch his friend eat pasta salad. So oh. his friend goes, where's Joey? And I was like, but Joey didn't order. I'm not the psychic waitress. That's three ninety nine a minute. You know, I didn't say that because yeah. I always think of the cool shit later. Right. Not always, but that time I thought of the cool shit later. And then I got him his pasta salad because it was pre-made. But I was That's one of the things that I've been hearing a lot lately. Uh, a lot of musicians that play in front of literally thousands upon thousands of yeah. people are, uh, are introverted and, oh, yeah. uh, you oh, yeah. know, I've heard like Kurt Cobain was James Hetfield and Metallica. Oh, yeah. And, you know, mm-hmm. I'm hearing all these, all these people that were, are like, they're generally shy. Yeah. They don't, you know, mm-hmm. b- before they became famous, they didn't want to be around people and now oh, yeah. they're performing in, it's the same thing, uh, pretty much for bartenders, I think, cause I'm mm-hmm. naturally introverted. But, yeah. uh, but, I, but I used bartending as an exercise to actually learn to talk to people. I can absolutely relate to that. Yeah. I was a super shy kid. I read a lot. Uh, I was insecure. I just kind of assumed that everybody hated me and nobody wanted to talk to me. <laughs> yeah. And uh, because I moved around a lot, so I had a hard time making friends. Mm-hmm. And, and, uh, and so for me, like my first year waiting tables really brought me out of my shell. Um, and really taught me that I have something in common with everyone mm. and really taught me to look for those commons and to really, really taught me to exercise my humor and to appreciate humor and to really take in people and not see them as just dollar signs. Right. And, and it really, that, that helped take me out of my shell. And the, the more I did it, you know, from, from going, starting as a wait, waitressing at IHOP was my first waitressing job. I went from hostessing at Denny's to waitressing at IHOP. And then I moved to New York and settled on a couple of jobs before I finally found that place that I really liked. And, uh, and they were, they were not around anymore, around the clock. And they, they let me, uh, gave me a chance to bartend. And then from there, that bridged the gap over into the club scene. Mm. which brought me out of my shell even more. Yeah. So it, it, now I'm, you know, you wouldn't guess at all that I was ever a shy person because <laughs> I'm like, I'm joking with people in multiple languages because, you know, I, I talk so much shit. I don't know what my ass is for. Mm. <laughs> so I learned extra languages so I could talk more shit to more people. So I am an international shit talker. <laughs> now that is handy. I, I, I wish I could do mm-hmm. that. So, you know, you, you build it. I mean, a, a lot of it started in Texas. A lot of my friends in Texas were Spanish speakers. Mm. And then being in the restaurant industry for so many years, you know, and having so many Spanish speaking friends, uh, it became just kind of a fun thing. And Spanish speakers are the most generous in terms of really giving you a chance to practice mm. and, and not judging you. You know, the French are a little harder. I studied four <laughs> years of French in high school. And like, oh, vous, vous ne parlez pas français. Tu, 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 tu. So I always start by telling them, je parle français comme un singe bourré, which is I speak French like a drunk monkey. Mm-hmm. Don't expect too much. But I kind of say the same thing <laughs> to people in Spanish, so they don't expect too much. <laughs> but I understand more than I speak. Because I'll go into the kitchen and they'll be talking shit to each other. I'll be like, tranquilo, putos locos. 
<laughs> which is, yeah, you know, yeah. calm down, you crazy bitches. Yeah, yep. <laughs> I got, I caught that. <laughs> uh, so, uh, I only know enough, uh, Spanish in order to make somebody that speaks Spanish think I know Spanish, you know, just a few okay. key phrases here and there. So and then they rattle it off to you and you're like, uh, is that total? No, they, uh, they don't really start rattling it off, but they're afraid to talk shit behind mm-hmm. my back from there on out. Right. <laughs> and uh you know, I've, yeah. I've scared a couple people but uh, uh right yeah, but, but anyway <laughs> well just to tease my spanish-speaking friends i like to say to them yeah. which is you know really you smart know. ass this is the united states of america we speak yeah. english here right and nobody who actually believes that would ever say it in spanish <laughs> yeah <laughs> 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 so they stop for a second and they laugh because that's the joke <laughs> that's good so if you ever have a chance practice whatever you can with your spanish speaking friends because yeah. it's, it's pretty cool and you know it's really been nice to reach out to my customers i, I can say thank you in most languages mm. uh and beer in most languages and i mean i had one shy guy come in one day and um and he was polish and I know a tiny bit of Polish and I know how to say thank you. So when I thanked him in Polish, that started our friendship. Mm-hmm. And now we're actual genuine friends now. And he's trying to teach me more Polish. And thanks to him, I can say big ass in Polish. <laughs> Duja dupa. Duja dupa. Okay. I'm, Duja dupa. I'll be writing that down later when, I, when I'm editing this podcast. <laughs> But it's those little things like we've got a, a Chinese woman that comes in and, you know, I like to say silly things to her that I tried to pick up in Chinese, like mm. a chin bong ju, what a dee dee, which means please help my little brother. Okay. But I just like the way it sounds. Yeah. Chin bong ju, what a dee dee. <laughs> <laughs> and she thinks I'm silly when I say it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's cool. You uh, relate to the uh, more internationally. Uh, I don't hear... Well, I mean, English and Spanish, that comes up quite a bit in a lot of the yeah. bartenders that I've talked to. But right. when it comes to like Polish, I've never, right. unless the person was born speaking that, I've right. never heard of them actually trying to learn it. Yeah. But that's cool. That's really but like cool. like Norwegian is talk and thank you is basigol. So mm-hmm. I just kind of pop out there with talk or basigol. And they're like, oh, hey. <laughs> I'm like, you want more ul? And they're like, oh. I'm like, that's my three words. That's all I got. <laughs> but it, even though it's a tiny, tiny bit, sometimes that's what it takes to really open. They're like, oh, you're aware of me a little bit. You're aware of my culture. And that's, you know, mm-hmm. and, and people appreciate that because I want people when they come in to feel welcome, no matter where they're from, no matter who they are, no matter what their sexual orientation is, no matter what's going on in their life. I really want them to feel welcome. And that's kind of my way of letting them know, like, you're, you're welcome here. Yeah. So when you started working as a waitress uh, to bartender, working on your social skills and all that, was that about the time uh, you s- where that clip you sent me at the Jenny Jones show that you were on? Uh, that was a little bit later because even though I was kind of shy, I was also a drama nerd. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that was, the I outfit came, you were wearing I, on there really seemed like you know, like uh, stage uh, clothing and <laughs> uh, props and stuff like that. Well, the, the designer is an, uh, a, 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 a New York designer called Kitty Boots. And she used to do a lot of fetish and club wear mm. uh, back in the 90s. And she did a lot of really fun studded shirts and stuff like that. So, And then the, uh, the corset was a BDS and M designer body worship. Mm. And, uh, and, what, uh, and what they, uh, and he, I, I hope he's still around and I hope he's doing well, but I, I still, I still have that entire outfit. <laughs> if I, I'm actually halfway tempted to get a blue wig and be myself as that meme that they turned <laughs> me into for Halloween. Well, just, just for the hell of it. Well, nowadays, if, uh, well, even with the horns aren't, uh, aren't that big, but people probably think you're going for a Maleficent type of look but oh yeah yeah anyway i mean i wear an outfit like that on the train getting ready to go to a club and nobody messes with me because i look like i don't get their ass well <laughs> you know? especially those fingers yeah that, <laughs> yeah that you had, had yeah on the no show. those i still have those too i still have those too <laughs> but uh that um the club scene kind of brought me more in touch with the, the bds and m stuff mm. so some of the clubs i worked at uh, were like, uh, they were like, it was drag queens and gay clientele and just like a really eclectic international group of people everywhere. And certain nights would be like bondage themed nights and stuff like that. So yeah. 
you know, I slowly kind of like got more into the S and M scene through working in those particular clubs. Mm. And so that opened up a whole other theatrical aspect and, as well. But when I first moved to New York, it was to be an actress. And my very first play I was in, I met Dr. Ruth Westheimer. She was friends oh, with the producer. Wow. Is she as short as she looks? <laughs> she's tiny. <Yeah>. She's <laughs> tiny. Usually she just looks, she's, so, so, she's adorable. <laughs> so she walks up and talks to me, right? It's not like I went up and fangirled her yeah. because when I was younger, I was like, I had a little more experience than my nerdy friends did. So mm. they'd come to me for advice and I'd always impersonate her, right? I'd always say, now don't forget the contraceptive. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Because that's all you really need to know. Like have fun, but don't forget the contraceptive. So when I met her, I was just blown away. And um, I was in this play and at the first, um, the first uh, act of the play, I, I played this French speaking waitress with the vocabulary limited to we this year yeah and the second act i played uh um, a uh, an addict that's the politically correct term now and that's something i want to talk about a little bit later in this podcast sure. because it's kind of my main reason for coming on um and so i get off stage and i had uh, i had more facial piercings and stuff back then like i'm like surgery years old now and it's just a pain in the butt to keep taking piercings out and putting them in and all of that all the time and yeah. you get to the point where like you're getting older i mean i'm 49 <laughs> <laughs> so you know it's, it's a pain in the butt at this point but back then i had my piercings and she comes right up to me and she goes don't stare at me but at it is it that you have here <laughs> She actually asked you. And that. I, no shit. And I'm like, I cannot believe this is my life right now. This is so cool. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, I listed them for her. And then she goes, So, I, I'm, I, I'm not making this up. I swear to God, I never lie unless I'm not standing or sitting, right? She says to me, So, what does that do for you sexually? <laughs> and I'm like, I can't believe this. This is my very first play in New York. And, and she came up to me. And wanted to talk to me mm. about the sexual benefits <laughs> of body tears. <laughs> <clears throat> but that's what's fun about bartending is I could bring in the aspects of having been an actress and having been a performer. Mm -hmm. I did comedy for years and, sure. it, and I worked comedy clubs too. And I, I even auditioned for Def Jam. <laughs> Oh, really? <laughs> oh, they hated me, <laughs> but it was kind of my favorite set ever. Because like uh, I was the I was the blue haired bitch that had been selling everybody seven dollar Bud Lights all night, mm. and they just gave me a spot to be nice. Like I wasn't really an official contender. There was no way they were going to consider me. And there were two white people and two girls, and I was the only white girl up there, right? Mm. So I get up after uh, selling everybody, and this is in the nineties. Seven dollar Bud Lights in the nineties. That was a lot. That's a lot. In the people 90s, were mad yeah. at me. People were mad at me. <laughs> so I get up on stage, but the gratuity was included. So mm. get up on stage, and I had this old joke I used to do about how I hated it when uh, men use lame pickup lines, like "What's your size?" Yeah. So I'm yeah. like, "Do not enter. What's yours? Beware of dogs." <laughs> Unless I like them, then it's proceed with caution. Right. <laughs> This guy starts groaning when I tell that joke. And I'm like, oh, he's just upset because that's what I said to him. He goes, I'm not a dog, baby. I don't bark. And I said, all I'm saying to you, Sparky, is that that line's too long for the bathroom. There's a fire hydrant around the corner. <laughs> this other guy that was sitting across from him starts talking shit, but I couldn't understand a word the guy was saying. So I was like, well, if you're going to be talking shit, you're going to be talking out your ass when you talk to me, you need to stand up. Mm. <laughs> I don't understand a word you're saying. Mm. And this guy in the back calls me Smurfette. And I looked at him and I'm like, look before I colorblind motherfucker. Smurfette was a blonde. I was a brunette at the time. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and this other guy goes, get off, get off. And I'm like, you better believe this is getting me off. I'm going to have to dry off after this set. Y'all have been cheaper than therapy. I'm out. <laughs> People were high-fiving me after that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. People were like, that was great. People were like, what is your MC name? You know, and it was like, it was, it was, it was, you know, it was like people were busting on me, but, but it was love. It was still love. Yeah. You know, and I'm like, I've been picked on since I was four. So if you got something new by my own family, 
<laughs> so if you got something new, you better bring it. Like yeah. you better bring your game. So I love hecklers because I will shut them down yeah. like that. So uh, do you have to be careful when you're behind the bar? Because uh, especially in this day and age, people get mm-hmm. offended by the wind blowing. Uh, and do you have to be a little bit more, you have to censor yourself a little bit more? Or? I don't feel like that, especially where I work. Mm. I work at a punk rock dive bar. Our specialty drink is ass juice. We show weird porn on the screen all night long. Mm. Like midgets are getting it. Bridget's a midget. I've actually met her. She's really cool. <laughs> uh, Granny's getting it because social security's run out. I'll even joke. I was I had these French group come in the other day and they were looking at the granny porn. And I was like, oh, saw some, say my grandma. I'm like, yeah, that's my grandma. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's one of those kind of places where, um, uh, but also too, at the same time, you know, I'll talk all kinds of crazy shit. But uh, homophobia, racism, any of that kind of stuff is not tolerated. And I have kicked out more than one person mm-hmm. for that kind of stuff. I'm like, if you're going to be homophobic, if you're going to be racist, if you're going to be talking all that kind of stuff, you know, you're, you're gone because you're not. I, I need everybody to feel comfortable here. Or if they're making women feel uncomfortable, mm-hmm. you know, like this one guy I had to kick out for using the N word. You know, the same guy, you know, he, uh, this girl was stretching. He's like, oh, are you doing that for me? And the girl was just stretching and he's all creeping up on her. And, you know, so, I mean, there, there's definitely a limit in my humor mm. um, where I, uh, where I don't think any of that kind of stuff is funny. And I feel like if, uh, if you stay away from any kind of hate speech, I mean, you're doing all right. Yeah. And you respect people for who they are. You respect their pronouns if they tell you that they prefer certain pronouns. You know, I've got a family member now who recently came out as, um, as well, actually years ago, they came out as bi, then they came out as pan. Then they came out as Mm non-binary. But the thing is, is I'm cool with all of that, but they're on their like 12th name right now. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. And I'm like, child, I don't care who you love. I don't care what you identify as. For the love of God, pick a name. I'm too old for this. I don't care if you want to be called supercalifragilisticexpialidociousalexpialidocious. Pick a damn name, child. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You know, and so that's how I am with my customers. And, you know, there's a lot of stuff that you can laugh about that isn't crossing any, you know, homophobic or racist lines. And I think that those are the things that people are most sensitive about right now for reasons. You know, there's so much comedy where you can punch up. There's plenty of jackasses with a billion bucks who are like flying around in space, like a bunch of space cowboys that we can laugh at. Yeah, definitely. Uh, <laughs> so. Yeah, I uh, back in the early 2000s when I uh, when I was bartending, I used to kind of police people's smart ass remarks just because. Uh, well, political correctness uh, correctness wasn't isn't up mm-hmm. to the caliber mm-hmm. that it is now, but of course not. Uh, but I used to get on people, uh, telling them that, uh, you know, gay jokes don't do them. Yeah. They're too easy. Yeah. You know, you're, yeah. I want, you know, I, if you're going to insult somebody, I want you to use your mind. You actually do something because yeah. it's just too easy. Unless just to you're do. gay. And gay people tell the yeah. best gay jokes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Then they, then they actually have the license that they have yeah. the obligation. To, but mm-hmm. when two guys that just got off the gym, yeah. And they just yeah. decide to, uh, you know, start right. using the uh, slurs mm-hmm. and so the F it's word just like, and all of that. Yeah, yeah. I uh, I walk over and okay, mm-hmm. guys. First of all, keep it yeah. down. Second of all, mm-hmm. think of something else because yeah. it's this is done. The original. Yeah. <laughs> word. But word. Yeah, Amen, yeah. brother Anthony. <laughs> Preach. Preach, brother. But. Uh, Back in uh, uh, back when I used to bartend, it was uh, it wasn't uh, as easy to uh, mm-hmm. offend as many people, and we didn't have to yeah. uh, be conscious of pronouns. Yeah, I mean, yeah, most of the time when I didn't know somebody, mm-hmm. I'd be, "Hey, how you doing?" or "What's up, dude?" "Hey, man," or yeah. uh, you know, yeah. use the generics. But it was right. binary back then. I yeah. didn't and yeah. Uh, but I think, you know, my, my friends in the, in the non-binary and trans community, they're aware they could see the difference between people who are disrespecting them mm-hmm. and someone who's, you know, who's trying but slipped up. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that they can appreciate that. 
and, and the ones who can't, I mean, I, I, I just hope that they, they, they learn that some people are trying and that not everyone is their enemy because some people I think have been attacked so much that it's easy to assume that someone's your enemy. But I also don't mind offending people too, because if people come in and they suck, I've got full license to let them know they suck. I mean, we've, we've got uh, what we call uh, the manager behind the bar and it is a dick on a stick with a little eyeball at the head. And it's got a, um, a, um, a a Corona poncho on it. And it says the manager on it. Mm. And if somebody wants to get all Karen on me and be like, I want to talk to the manager. And I'll be like, all right, it's the manager right here. And the manager says, get the fuck out. Mm. Get out. <laughs> hey, bartender. You know, sometimes when I'm working, I don't have a lot of time to eat or even sit down. But sometimes you just got to have something in your stomach. Otherwise, you're just going to have a rough afternoon. That's why I keep a raw rev nutrition bar in my backpack at all times that way if i just need something quick to put in my stomach i just grab into my bag i eat it it's good for you it has high quality plant-based proteins no soy or whey proteins uh they're nutrition and diet conscious ingredients healthy proteins fats and fiber nothing artificial and they've got a lot of these great flavors uh like creamy peanut butter and sea salt peanut butter, dark chocolate, and sea salt, double chocolate, brownie batter, and birthday cake, and tons of other flavors. Go check them out, www.rawrev.com. Use Hey Bartender at checkout to get 5% off your entire order. Go to www.rawrev.com, and don't forget to use promo code Hey Bartender. Hey Bartender. You know, you things know. are a lot looser at your bar than the bars I've ever worked at, it seems like. Well, in some of the bars I've worked at, I didn't have the luxury to just kind of pull, you know, pull things out and let people know, hey, this isn't working. Like, uh, for instance, I was slammed, just slammed for a Sunday night about a month ago. And, uh, and nobody seemed to know what they want. They didn't have their money ready. And I had just gotten to the point with these people, right, where I was just like, yo, and I pulled out my whip and I made an announcement. Mm-hmm. And I'll pull out the whip now just because I love drama. Yeah. So, Oh, actual whip. <laughs> Attention, please. <laughs> yeah. I need you to help me help you. We got rules here. Rule number one, know what you want. Rule number two, have your money ready. Rule number three, keep it simple. Rule number four, the more you tip, the sexier you are. I also use that for birthday shout out and to let people know that happy hour or not happy hour. Um, also to let people know it's the last call for help. That would get people's attention. Definitely. <laughs> it, it most definitely. Nobody can be like, oh my God, I didn't hear you. No, they heard me down the damn block. <laughs> but that's again being a bartender i mean i my 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 fun that i've had in the snm community um I, I, if you want to hear about how i learned how to crack a whip i could tell you that um my uh my my, my comedy my my fun that i like to have with languages um i read psych books for fun mm. so you know so my love of like psychology and trying to understand uh, different people and sometimes really complicated personalities Um, It all just kind of ties together to where I I never thought that I would have, I'd have a chance to really truly express and explore so many interests Mm. with one crazy little job slinging drink. Well, when you meet up with so many different personalities, I mean, uh, you have Mm -hmm. a chance to really dip your fingers in every little thing. Mm -hmm. And I mean... I mean, uh, for uh, anything, it's not, a lot of people have these stereotypes that there's just sports nuts. That's why there's so many damn sports mm-hmm. bars out there. But right, uh, I use the people that I, I know nothing, absolutely nothing about sports. And yeah. so when people try to talk to me about sports, I'm like, ah, I got mm-hmm. nothing for you. But yeah. I know enough to keep, get a conversation going. But right. um, if they want to talk to me about music, 
As long as mm-hmm. I, I warn them every time, if you ask me any questions about the Beatles, you're going to get at least a half hour lecture because I love right. talking about the Beatles. That's your shit. Yeah. yeah. But when uh, everybody knows a little bit about something and you can kind of pick and choose from each personality mm-hmm. what you want to learn from them. And, uh, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, they I'm, most of the time our customers are always pretty happy to talk about their interests. So. Yeah, and I mean, and I mean, we get some worldwide experts sometimes sitting at our bars. Sometimes we get some know it all, yeah, yeah. <laughs> drunken know it all. But I mean, I you know, I've had some people who genuinely really know what the hell they're talking about sitting at my bar, explaining some pretty cool stuff to me. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, and yeah. not talking to a guy that spends uh, eight eighteen hours on the road in his truck and then tries to tell you the the algorithm for figuring out when a poker machine's about to pay out. And yeah. Uh, hmm. Those guys, not very interesting to talk to. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, it depends on what you find interesting. Right. Some people might be into that. Me personally, uh, I, I just, I'm interested in people in general. And even if they're talking about something that I particularly might not be that interested in or might not know much about, it's still, I'm just kind of, Seeing what they're about. Mm. This is them telling me what they're about. Also, too, a lot of times when you'll, you'll meet somebody, I mean, we, uh, we you know, we ex- expect so many people uh, to be, uh, you know, neuronormal, but there are a lot of people who are neurodivergent. And there are people that we have that are customers that, you know, we don't know this because we're not their doctor and it's really none of our damn business, but they're on the autism spectrum. Right, right. And, you know, and I know I've had several customers that there's just a certain way that a lot of them communicate. And I'm like, okay, this is really cool. So this is my chance, you know, to learn, you know, something from somebody who's like really hyper focused about something. Mm. So, I mean, it's, it's really, it's really cool. But I mean, I, you know, as much as I love these people and I learn from them, I worry about them too. And what I'm really worried about these days um, is the overdoses. Right. Um, and um, I started keeping Narcan at the bar a couple of years ago. What's that? It is uh, it's the stuff that, that you could spray into the, uh, somebody's nose after that they've um, they've um, overdosed. Oh, okay. To bring them back, and uh, we really do like. I haven't had anybody overdose where I work, um, but I mean, we still we got to keep an eye on people. But what's happening even more and more now? It's not even just the people who. Uh, and I carry it in my on my backpack in my backpack with me because um, I got I got injured and I had to go to the hospital and they were wondering if I was just trying to get drugs mm. out of the injury. I'm like, oh no, I know what you guys are driving at, and no, I don't want the drugs, but uh, but I do want that Narcan. I think you're trying to talk to me about, and it's for free and it's I don't know what the the laws are by the state, but I really encourage all bartenders, all bars to not only have Narcan but also know how to properly administrate it. And there's plenty of videos on YouTube that you could look up on how to do it properly. And you can, you could read the directions as well. Um, is it as, part, for me, is it as easy to mm-hmm. administer as like an EpiPen or easier, easier, easier. Yeah. I mean, just in their notes, mm. easier. And uh, you can keep it like in your little drawer with your first aid kits or anything like that. And it's good to have at least a couple of them on hand because what's happening though, is it's not, just um, the the opioid users. It's people who are doing party drugs and who are doing that coke, who are doing Molly, who are doing other stuff. You know, uh, Adderall that they bought on the street or whatever. They're finding out a lot of these drugs have fentanyl in them. Mm-hmm. And so what's happening is people who aren't normal drug dealers, uh, drug dealers, I'm sorry, normal drug users, they're going they're going out and about with their friends and doing a bump with their friends and ending up dying in the back of a club or ending up hospitalized for a week because there's fentanyl in the drugs that they're doing. Usually the regular users, they know who they're getting it from. So it's a little bit easier than say tourists who come to town, you know, which is why whenever I have tourists to express, you know, interest in partying, first of all, I say, you're not doing any lines of Coke on my bar. Yeah, If I catch you doing it, I will kick you out. Okay, not because I'm judging, but because I'm trying to keep a full bar open. Mm. So just know that the only line of Coke you're doing on my bar is I'll line up a bunch of shot glasses full of Coca-Cola. That's the only <laughs> line of Coke you're doing on my bar. Mm. Um, but we do have these fentanyl test strips now. And this is a really important organization. 
And I think a lot of bartenders and bar owners and people in the customer service industry really need to look into it. Um, and what it is, is um, people can test their drugs. They take just an ounce of water. They put a tiny bit of the drug in there. They put the strip in there. And within five minutes, they can tell whether the drug has fentanyl or not. Oh. A friend of a friend actually recently, my friend insisted that their friend test their drugs, tested it three times. It tested three times possible, uh, positive for fentanyl. And that person's alive today because they tested their stuff. Mm. And um, in fentcheck.org, F-E-N-T-C-H-E-C-K dot O-R-G, they are San Francisco based. Uh, they are sending them to San Francisco. Various bars in uh, Manhattan and Brooklyn now have them. Um, I try to keep them at double down. And even if our fent check bucket is empty, uh, I'm telling people if they're listening, if you come there and I'm there, you see me, I'm Bobby Jean. Uh, you let me know because I do try to keep a couple set aside in case people really need them. Mm -hmm. And you let me know. And if I have some in my own personal little staff, I will give them to you. I make sure my friends know that I have them on me as well as in our can whenever I'm out and about because I've lost too many friends to overdoses. Mm -hmm. And whether they're addicts or not, they deserve a chance to survive the night. And I think that harm reduction really is uh, an important thing that we need to be talking about. And with a bunch of party holidays coming up, oh, yeah. we're going to have an upsurge in overdoses. And also, if people want to donate to fitcheck.org, they're definitely worth it. I ran a donation for them for my, uh, for my birthday. Uh, they've been doing a really good job of keeping uh, Double Down in stock. And, uh, and so, I mean, I really encourage people if they really want to do something or to look into other organizations because they're not the only organization out there that's doing stuff in terms of helping with harm reduction. Get Narcan. Keep that at your bar. Keep an eye on people. If somebody's in the bathroom too long, know what's going on. We card everybody that comes into the bar that we don't know partially because uh, whether they look like they're of age or not, because a lot of times if someone is an addict, they might have lost their ID and they're just going into the bathroom to try to shoot up. Sure. But if they've lost their ID, they can't get in there. Um, or if somebody's a thief, they're not going to want to show us their ID if they're just trying to like look for some stuff to steal. So a lot of times like it dissuades people like that. But I mean, really just kind of keep an eye on, uh, we got to keep an eye on our customers and need them to survive the night. And with the party holidays coming up and fentanyl is everywhere. We need to do what we can and look into whatever local community stuff that, uh, that, you know, they can do as well. Most definitely. Yeah. I'm going to bring this up just because uh, I wasn't bartending uh, that night when I, mm -hmm. when I witnessed this, but me mm -hmm. and a couple other guys were wandering through this uh, nearby uh, like bar strip and outside we see these three businessmen probably early mm -hmm. 40s sitting with a girl mm -hmm. that was probably early 20s and she was mm -hmm. kind of going uh, all over the place and uh the first question that i had i mean you're talking about fentanyl mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. uh if somebody but is also date rape drugs that's yes. uh that's what i wanted to know if it was good for the uh it worked for the date rape drug it's a shame that that's not. There is a really cool thing out right now, though, um, that you can get. It's like a scrunchie, and it's got this little cap on top that you could put over your drink to make it harder for anyone to slip anything into your drink. Mm. Um, I'm a big fan of I don't let my drink leave my hand, and I only drink beer most of the time anyway. I'm like a three or four beer drunk, and that's it. I'm done for the night. I'm good. I'm less but, than I that. Mean, that way, <laughs> yeah. Oh, I know. I've heard you're such a good boy. I can see a halo. <laughs> you see a little halo. It's not headphones. It's a halo. <laughs> but um, but yeah, it's um, and that's another thing that we keep an eye on too, though, because if guys are kind of pushing in too close, I had these guys get upset with me one night because I had this beautiful lesbian couple, um, and they were you know hanging out with each other at the bar, and all of a sudden these two these three guys came in, and they were just surrounded by these guys, and the guys were just like all up on them. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm like, guys, and there was plenty of other space at the bar. It wasn't like that busy. I'm like, guys, give the ladies some space. And I think they were up to something because the minute I said that, they got mad. They mad. They stormed out, and the last guy kicked the door on his way out. Mm. And and the way that they were just hovering over these women, 
you know, and I'm not, I, I'm lucky that I haven't seen anything happen, but that is something that I wish that there was something that women could check their drink. It, um, and there is, I think, but I mean, it's, it's not cheap. I think they're like $5 each or something. I feel like I've looked them up online and they're like $5 each or something. And that's like the cost of a drink. Well, I, I remember, uh, it had to have been, uh, well over 20 years ago where mm-hmm. they were, uh, the food and drug administration was trying to put an additive in, in ruhefanol or, uh, I mm-hmm. think that's how you pronounce it, where it right. actually changes color when it goes into a liquid and I don't, I'm not sure if that ever well, caught what happened on with that. Yeah. I don't, I don't yeah. think that caught on or maybe they're using yeah. something else or something. I don't know. But, yeah. uh, that would, that was my first con, uh, automatic concern when you mentioned yeah. that, uh, yeah. cause I, that girl that night, mm-hmm. me and my friends, we were genuinely concerned cause she's around oh, yeah. three older men and, and you she don't know if they're her straight. friends that are looking after her, exactly, or if they're, you know, or, or if they're, you know, they're about to kidnap her, put in a hotel room, and traffic her for whatever, right. you know, yeah. We we and, and, up... and it's hard to. It's got to be. It's it's really hard sometimes knowing when to get involved and when not to. That's why I think we can do good by maybe clicking quick pictures with our cell phones. Mm-hmm. That or or something like you know in a way where uh, maybe you can catch the guy's faces. That way, if he does turn up missing, at least you could be like, "Hey, look, this is something that you know I happen to see that night in that area." I mean, I think that if I saw something like that, that that's what I would try to do because I'm, you know, I'm five six and one hundred and forty pounds, and it's not like, and I don't know kung fu like you do. <laughs> I know you don't. <laughs> But, I'm only a brown belt. Uh, I'm not. A... <laughs> that's still pretty badass, man. Like props to you, and it's more respect to you that you're not like trying to prove anything with it. You're like, I, I got it if I need it. It's, it's, it's right the, here in my pocket there. if I yeah. need it. Yeah, that's that, and that you're using it. You know, that you use it for like you know meditation and to really kind of your know, anxieties and stuff. I think that's awesome. Uh, but I mean, I would. That's the only thing I would feel like I was in the power to do would be like to take a picture and maybe call the cops and be like, look, this looks kinky to me. I don't know what's going on, but this girl was here with these guys and here's a picture and, and, it, and it's hard. It really is. Cause I mean, I've seen people being pulled out of clubs and because like I wasn't working that night or I, you know, whatever, it was a busy night or whatever. I don't know if this guy is with this girl or not. Mm. If he's, you know, her boyfriend and she just got too wasted because she's like 98 pounds and, you know. Yeah, we uh, we were genuinely concerned, uh, and so we went into the bar that we just came out of because we made friends with the mm-hmm. bartender. Uh, one of, one of my friends had a big crush on her, but and so did I, truthfully. But uh, uh, we all have had our bartender crushes. <laughs> hey, but, Cole Martin, how you doing? <laughs> but uh, anyway. uh, we when we went outside, saw that she couldn't even sit up straight. Uh, we thought about it mm-hmm. for a little bit, and then we went back into mm-hmm. the bar and said. You got this girl sitting right in front of your uh, mm-hmm. bar with three uh, older men, and she can't sit up straight. I think you should probably call yeah. somebody. And mm-hmm. they ended up calling the cops. An ambulance ended up showing up. And uh, according to the bartender, we uh, we went back and talked to her a little bit later. The girl had to go to the hospital to get her stomach pumped. We don't know what happened to her, why she had uh, to get her stomach pumped. We yeah. don't know what happened to the three older gentlemen. But... Uh, yeah. uh, at least, it's a good thing you guys did that. Yeah, at least we exactly. kind of felt good that we got her yeah. help in, yeah. in yeah. you know, whether she needed it or not. Maybe she was, yeah. she did that on purpose. I don't know, but. Yeah, and I do what I can too um, when I've got people who want, you know, they're going outside to smoke a cigarette and they can't bring their drink with them or something, you know, to do what I can to kind of set their drink aside somewhere, keep it somewhere safe for them. Um, I, uh, I don't accept drinks from people I don't know. Exactly. You shouldn't when I'm out and about and I, and I never have. And unless you I, have the it, bartender pour it in from, front of you yeah. in front of you. Exactly. Um, or open the beer in front of me. Mm. Exactly. And that's, um, that's why, um, I've, I've like accidentally on purpose kind of spilled drinks into the trash. I'm like, Oh, oops, oops there it goes. <laughs> you know, cause I didn't want to be rude Yeah. to the guy that was buying me a drink yeah. and be like, look, you know, I don't totally trust that you're not like a rapist. So, Hey, <laughs> <laughs> Because most people aren't. Most people are decent. Sure. You know, a lot of and people I, are misunderstood. And I, think, and I do think that um, women are too quick to 
label a guy a creeper just because he's not their type. Mm -hmm. A creeper is somebody who can't take no for an answer. Right. But if somebody's putting it out there in a way that's not rude or gross, you know, like telling somebody they should wear an evening gown with a fur coat because that was obviously really a horrible thing of you to do on TikTok. Oh, come on. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, boy, that you was really so, did. So, so. You, you, you bad boy. You've I done was, some research for this show, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> I got a great memory, too, man. You were cracking me up with that. I was just like, what you should have done, what I would have done. Would have been like, oh, you think I should do it? And then borrow an evening dress from one of your friends and get yourself a fake fur coat or go to a, like a store or something and take a picture. I'm like, I got you right here, babe. <laughs> no, that's out of my comfort zone. I can't. I do that, think but... you would look amazing in an evening dress. Are you kidding? If Iggy Pop can do it, you can uh, do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you saw how skinny he is. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. You can do it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's, uh, that I, it was really weird that one personality on TikTok, she, uh, she mm -hmm. was taking suggestions from people and she attacked me. And then in turn, all of her fans started attacking me too. And I just, yeah. And I thought, whoa, 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 whoa. I thought, no, yeah. okay. That was a mistake. Sorry. <laughs> you know, yeah. you know uh, I, I don't spend much time on TikTok. But every so often, I'll catch a clip that they'll they'll put on my Facebook feed, right? And um, I have never even heard the song, uh, that song that goes, I understood the assignment. I've never even heard the whole song. Mm. And I'm already sick of it. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of TikTok songs that I'm sick of. <laughs> like, why? Like, why do they all pick the same? There's uh, so many great songs out there. What are you doing, kids? Yeah. Anyway. I love these kids, but some of them, if they were my children, they'd have shaken baby syndrome. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you. <laughs> uh, yeah. Some of the songs I'm just, uh, yeah. uh, the one that, uh, says, Oh no, Oh no, Oh no, no, no. Oh yeah. That one again. Oh my yeah. God. It, it, uh, <laughs> you, you hear it. You're like, Oh no. Yeah. Like Dane Cook makes me want to go out and punch a baby, you know? <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Now comedians, uh, the David Tell. I met him on MySpace. I would love to meet him. Uh, <laughs> and he's actually a super cool dude. Yeah. He, um, I met him on MySpace and I went to see him perform one night at the cellar mm. and he recognized me right away. He walked right up to me and he's just like, you look just like your MySpace picture. <laughs> That's rare. So um, yeah. I ended up, uh, like I ran into him, a, a, I had a, probably a couple years later and I was dating someone at the time. Mm. And, uh, but we, we, you know, happened to walk by the comedy cellar and he was out there with another friend of mine who is a dominatrix who, uh, taught me a lot of this stuff that I know, but not how to crack a whip. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so I was friends with her and, uh, and this guy who, you know, throws parties and stuff. And, uh, David tells like, yeah, come have drinks with us. So we went around the corner of this place and we go up there and we have drinks and I'm sitting there and my boyfriend was a cop at the time. Right. And David Pell is all like, Hey, so let's do a line of Coke off of her ass. <laughs> you know, pointing to my friend. Yeah. You know, and I mean, I, it's not my shit. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, you know, guys, like, like, I don't judge people who do that, but it's not, but if I were going to do it, it would have been with David Tell and off of my friend's ass. Like, mm. I assure you that that would have been <laughs> time to, in front of my cop boyfriend, of course. So, <laughs> so that was, uh, that was David Tell. And I, uh, I actually he, sent him an email a long time back, a uh, uh, long time ago, back when he was uh, doing his show Insomniac. Uh, I uh -huh. loved that show. And, it was a great show. Uh, I, uh, and it's so much respect to bar culture. And oh, he yeah. does like, he buys shots for everybody and he like tips really well. His favorite. And it was funny though, after that, we go to do another club, another bar and they didn't recognize him. I had to tell the guy at the door, I'm like, dude, this is David Tell. You want him in your bar. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, one of the f uh, favorite things that I ever heard him say is uh, he's handing another shot to a girl and he goes, hey, hey, watch it. One more shot and I'm attractive. But uh, <laughs> but uh, I sent him an email because he showed up in my hometown in Oregon. Mm -hmm. And uh, Oregon is famous for having the most strip clubs per capita than any other state in the United States. And, mm -hmm. of course, oh, it is, yeah. uh, of course, he had to go to one. And he went mm -hmm. to one that I don't particularly like. It's dirty. It's nasty yeah. and, and yeah. but it but historically it's uh like the second oldest bar in uh or strip club in oregon but right. i sent him an email 
saying, why did you, why in God's name did you go there? Why didn't you go to this place or this place or this place? And mm-hmm. he, uh, he was gr- gracious enough to send me an email back saying, well, yeah. we had trouble getting, uh, in getting the rights to go into these places, but from the sounds yeah. of it, I really want to party with you. <laughs> yeah. No, it's just no, like, he's a, yeah. He's, he was a cool dude. Yeah. He was really, you know, who else is cool is uh, Jim Gaffigan. Oh, really? Is it? Well, he, yeah. he just actually got the reputation in Hollywood right now of being one of the nicest guys out there. I mean, yeah. competing. He really, he with, was decent. He, he used to come into a comedy club. I worked at all the time. He tipped really well. Mm-hmm. Just a really nice, generous guy. Um, and like he just come in, just kind of work on his material, but he wouldn't take any shit from anybody either. You didn't have to tell him to take no shit. Mm. He already takes no shit. And uh, somebody had tried to film him or something or talk or whatever during his set. Like he would throw them out, mm. like physically throw them out. <laughs> and I've seen him do it. Um, but I ran into him one time. I was at a fetish party and uh, he and his wife uh, showed up. I mean, I just happened to, you know, whatever, show up for whatever reason. And I was the one person they recognized. He recognized. He's like, you. <laughs> and so he made me look so cool by like, I got to be the person that was like hanging out with Jim Gaffigan because I was like the one person that Gaffigan knew at this party. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, yeah, um, no, I've had some fun experiences like Johnny Rotten. Even Johnny Rotten? Wow. Uh, I met Johnny Rotten. Uh, we have mutual friends. Like I've got mutual friends with all kinds of people like Deborah Harry. Mm-hmm. Oh, he used to come into the oh. club I worked at all the time that I used to do coat check at. Mm-hmm. And coat check is a great job. It's like opposite of being a stripper. Other people take their clothes off and they pay you. <laughs> yeah. Very, right? that's... And at the end of the night, though, the guys were confused because I worked around a lot of trans people and, you know, drag queens and stuff. So at the end of the night, they'd be like, so tell me, are you a real girl? <laughs> <laughs> like if I was a drag queen, I'd have much larger tits. I assure you. <laughs> you know. Or they'd ask me if it was the coat check. I'd be holding on to a coat hanger. I'm like, no, it's an abortion clinic. Like, what do you think is going on here? <laughs> you know? <laughs> but uh, Deborah Harry was really cool. And I'd put her coat in the office so nobody, none of the drag queens tried to steal her stuff because she'd always give stuff away to everything, everybody anyway. Right. But, you know, she was really supportive of the drag community. So I'd tell somebody I love your wig. They'd be like, oh, Debbie gave it to me. <laughs> so Debbie was real down to earth. And I asked her if she could do anything different, what would she have done differently? She said she would have done porn instead. No kidding. <laughs> yeah. That is straight up what Debbie Harry said to me. Well, and I picture- uh, Johnny Rotten, I met at the same club. Uh-huh. And it was, uh, it was summertime and I was doing coat check. And you know who doesn't have a lot of money? Coat check girls in the summer. Yeah. <laughs> nobody's wearing a coat. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And I smoke, you know, more weed than Snoop Dogg. Yeah. Right. And, you know, and I could smoke at work like nobody cared. And uh, and so one of my friends was down there smoking, a, uh, rolling a joint of nice stuff because like her husband was an editor at Screw Magazine and they were the cool kids. Right. Mm. And I'm just like just geeky ass, blue haired, horn wearing coat shit girl. So I'm rolling up my stinky street shit. And because uh, that's all I could afford. Johnny Rotten comes downstairs. In that big red suit of his, bouncing downstairs, screaming at the top of his lungs, who's got the stinking pot? <laughs> and I'm so embarrassed because, like, here's my chance to meet great grandpa punk, right? And mm. I got the stinkiest, like, dirt, like, they shoved it in a tire from Tijuana or some shit. I don't know where this <laughs> is from, but good Lord, <laughs> I was not cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've met a lot of great celebrities and, uh, uh, if, oh, but I'm not cool though for it. Trust me. Like when I met Henry Rollins, cause you know how straight edge Henry Rollins yeah, is, right? Yeah. Right. And, and at the time, I mean, I smoked two packs a day. So I'm walking down St. Mark's here in New York and he's in front of the gap on St. Mark's. And I mean, being the jackass I am, I had to walk right up to him and talk to him. Mm. And, uh, and I'm just blowing smoke and he's just like, get away from me. But I was like telling him how I've been a fan forever and how my war is like one of my favorite albums ever. And how, like, you know, I loved it when I saw him at Lollapalooza. And, and he's just like, just go away already. He didn't say that. <laughs> yeah. But everything in his face and his body language was telling me just like, be gone, crazy <laughs> smoking lady. Yeah. Be gone. So just like Uma Thurman was not cool. Just like Johnny Rotten was not cool. <laughs> I am not one of the cool kids, I assure you. <laughs> oh, I'm sure if I uh, ran into some of my... 
uh, on screen crushes. Uh, I, I've got mm-hmm. I've got a list of them, but the, I would uh-huh. uh, I would complete. I probably wouldn't even be able to get near them as you know. Yeah. It's just they come up if they came up to my bar and sat down and I'd be, uh, yeah. waitress, come here, <laughs> try to make I sure I don't say anything that. stupid. <laughs> oh my God, the one I had the biggest crush on that I met was when I was working at the comedy club and for, uh, and we get random celebrities in there like Rue McClanahan, one of the Golden Girls. Oh sure, yeah, <laughs> yeah, she came in, um, and then uh, one night, um, and this is right after he and Brooke Shields divorced, Andre Agassi came in. Uh huh. Oh my God, he was beautiful and those dimples and he smiled and mm, he tipped me twenty dollars on his free vodka cranberry because the boss was like, yeah, whatever, cost him. And uh, and I was like, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, I didn't say that because but I was thinking that. Yeah. <laughs> if he wanted to make out, I would have said yes. Sure. Is what I'm trying to say there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I uh, I like hearing about uh, celebrity stories uh, from bartenders that have been on my shows. So, uh, but I've also thrown out hypotheticals to some of my mm-hmm. uh, some of the people that have been on the show. Like there was a girl that I or, um, I had that was a bartender that is a bartender in Canada, and mm-hmm. I said, "So Ryan Reynolds walks into your bar. What do you do?" And she's like, "Oh my god!" <laughs> and she starts yeah. going off and. Uh, you know, saying uh, I, if he all he needs to do is use the bathroom, I will guard the door. And and, <laughs> and it's, it's it's a fine art between like showing your admiration and playing it cool. Yeah. Like, <laughs> and when I met Al Pacino, oh my, God. I walked right past him. Yeah, that was wild. He was it was he was working on looking for Richard, and um, I happened to be just taking a walk up in the cloisters area just because it was kind of a wooded area, and I, I walk up these steps and uh, there's Al Pacino in his sense of a woman hat. And, mm-hmm. uh, and I love sense of a woman. Oh, great what movie. a great, great movie, mm-hmm. beautiful movie. And, uh, and I, and I told him I loved his work and he said, thank you. And then I just kind of moved on, but I was like, Oh my God, I just said El Pacino. I just said El Pacino. <laughs> 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 it's, you know, I was even geeky about meeting Afro man. Like it was so I cool. Saw that I picture. met Afro yeah. man at the Cincinnati airport and it was just <laughs> so, but he lives half an hour away from my grandma. And oh, I was from Cincinnati, you know, with family, and I was just like, "This has been kind of a rough trip," but I met Afro Man, and that was awesome. Oh, truth being told, I would not know who he was if, if unless it was because of uh, Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back. Uh, you would know who he was. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Because definitely. they used because I got high for the end credits mm-hmm. and uh, for the end song. Yeah, <laughs> he's you know, he he was he was so gracious. He was just like, oh, do you want to take one of those pictures things? And like, yeah. And I'm like, do you mind if I take another one? He's like, I get to hug you longer. I'm okay with that. <laughs> and he was just as sweet as he could be. Yeah. And one I wish I'd met, but I walked past him, but I met his whole family was Willie Nelson. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. When I worked at Hard Rock Cafe, I got to meet Trace Atkins there. Mm. Donkey Tonk, the Donk, the Donk. Uh, it's a hilarious song. I love funny country music. Mm. And uh, and I love Willie Nelson. Yeah, I've, oh, I've I've seen him four times in concert. I think the man is just amazing, and his wife is just this tiny little thing. And she put her arm around me, and she's like, "Oh, your name's Bobby Jean. Well, you're one of us." And she introduced <laughs> me to the whole family. Mm-hmm. And Willie walked by, and I nodded at him, and he nodded at me, but I didn't want to bug the man because you know he's a superstar and all that. Um, and uh, and he and her tipped me and my friend who works the party. It was his 80th birthday party at Hard Rock Cafe. Yeah. And me and my friend Taboo, uh, they uh, they tipped us five hundred dollars to split the penis. No, wow, that's yeah. nice. Now yeah. I since you're in New York and he he is my, uh, you know, right under the Beatles, uh, he is my idol, Billy Joel. Mm-hmm. Have you ever seen him walking around? No, no, probably no. not. <laughs> but that would be kind of cool. One time, though, somebody started a fire accidentally at Hard Rock Cafe because they threw confetti into a birthday uh, a birthday candle, <laughs> and uh, yeah. and so I walked over and I put it out with a cup of water because it wasn't a big fire. But after that, we had what was called a vibe host that would play different songs and stuff. And uh, first thing he did was uh, play uh, "We Didn't Start the Fire." <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Was, just hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> you got to love it when your uh, your DJ uh, at the club is right on point. Like, right. The, there was a contest. 
there was a contest. Uh, my the manager decided to hold where she had these pie pans with uh, a cherry in it filled with whipped cream, and uh, so uh, when they said go, the DJ immediately played "Lick It Up" by Kiss, and I'm oh, like, perfect. oh. Perfect, perfect song. <laughs> Good job. I like it too when a DJ will end uh, in the night, or somebody will just like end the night by playing the song. Uh, Don't go away, mad. Just go away. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's a good one. So you've been uh, bartending for uh, twenty five years. Nowadays, it's been coming up a whole lot. And now, mm-hmm. from what you've told me about the atmosphere of the bar that you have, it's a little bit yeah. rougher. It's uh, yeah. not exactly fine dining. Um, it's not, yeah, it, 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 it's kind of cute. We get girls come in with their little like fancy purses and then, you know, the, the, the more, you know, upscale kind of girls, they'll come in and they'll hear the music and they'll see the weird porn and they'll see the signs for ass juice and they'll look around and then they'll turn around and then they'll walk right out the door and it's like, okay, this is too much for you. I get that. <laughs> but, um, it's been coming up a whole bunch. I've been receiving a few emails about it. Uh, mm-hmm. how, do you deal with sexual harassment in your environment? Well, I am, especially where I'm at right now, mm-hmm. um, I really don't have to deal with it. Like the worst I had to deal with was uh, this one guy, he was a regular, uh, we became friends. He asked me out. I told him I am not on the same page. I just let him know I wasn't interested. He accused me of being patronizing. Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, I wasn't trying to be patronizing. I was just trying to, let somebody down in the way that I would like to be let down. Because mm. I don't want to discourage people from saying that they're interested because I think that there's too much of that. Because, you know, with some, like I say, some girls are so quick to call somebody a creep. And I'm like, if he was Brad Pitt and he was doing the same thing, would you call him a creep? Mm. You know, so, but, uh, and then he, 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 uh, he uh, kept like sending me messages and he got upset because I wasn't paying enough attention, uh, paying enough attention to him one night on Facebook. And he sent me just a whole bunch of messages. And he's like, well, apparently you think that I think that you're cute. Uh, that the fact, it seems to be the impetus of all of our conversations and all of that. And he was basically telling me I needed to get over myself. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And I, I was just like, why are you just randomly insulting me? Like I had stuff to do just because I didn't get back to you right away. And I get back to him the way I would any of my other friends. I mean, I thought he was kind of a condescending jerk, but I'm just like, Whatever. People online don't always come across as good as they do in person. I've got plenty of friends that are obnoxious online, but I love them to death. Yeah. You know, when I see them. Well, people's personality change when they're online, too. Uh, yeah, I, sometimes. I, some people say things that they would never say in public online. Ever. So. Exactly. So I just kind of blocked him from online, but I treated him like I would any other customer when he came in. And the first time he came back, he tried to steal my pen because we were out of house pens. So I let him use my own pen mm. and he tried to lie about it. And like, no, just give me my pen. Like, just stop lying. And after that, like, I wouldn't, I pay minimum attention to him. Like, I treat him like I would any other customer that I don't know that well. I'd give him his drink. I'd be polite to him. But I didn't ask how I was because he was a jerk to me. Mm. And I just kind of kept him at arm's length. And one night he just got so upset because I was talking to everybody else but him. And he started yelling at me and screaming at me. And he was just like, I'm not impressed with you. And I'm like, I'm just a girl doing her job. Like, I don't know why you're doing this. Mm. And, and he just starts yelling at me and he's like, you're so judgmental. And I'm like, I don't really think I'm that judgmental, but okay. And so I walked to the end of the bar, hoping that walking away, like he just kind of, and he just started screaming and yelling at me. And I mean, I know it boiled down to the fact that I wouldn't date him. Mm. And, and, I, and, and I had to kick him out. And he's like, you get off on this drama. You know you love this drama. And I really don't, man. Like, that's why I'm single and I've got three cats. I don't, <laughs> don't worry about what other people are doing. Mm. You know? <laughs> like, it's, it's not. I do. Trust me. Life gives me enough drama. And I'm just a supporting player here. So <laughs> it's okay. But the worst I dealt with was I worked at a large club a really large club in the city and I was a VIP manager Mm. and um and what I had to do was sell bottles it was bottle service and there were nights when I would walk through this crowded club with a bottle just tons of stuff in my arms and I walked through this one room one time and it was completely packed and this guy put his hand up my skirt 
Uh, okay, there crossed the line. Uh, that crossed the line immediately. Yeah, but what really sucks about it is I didn't know who did it because the place was too crowded for me to identify who actually did it. Mm-hmm. So somebody got my elbow, mm-hmm. but it really put me. It really had me in a situation where I didn't know what to do about that. Mm-hmm. Um, and the same place, um, like one of the managers got a little weird with me and, and that's pretty much the only place where I really dealt with it. And I, I, obviously, I mean, I didn't last there because people can say whatever they want. Yeah. I wasn't doing nothing. (laughs) Yeah. Well, if people could say whatever and I'll shut them down, Mm -hmm. like seriously, I will shut them down like. You know, some guy tried whistling at me and snapping his fingers to get my attention. I'll let him know right now I am not a dog, but I can be a bitch. Mm -hmm. The proper way to ask for a drink from me from this point on there is, please, goddess of all things intoxicating, bless me with another beverage. (laughs) Because you done fucked up. Mm -hmm. (laughs) uh, uh, I I watched the... uh, uh, the first episode of two broke girls just in passing one and the opening scene was a going, guy going waitress. And mm-hmm. then, uh, and she immediately was all over him about that. This mm-hmm. is this annoying. Mm-hmm. Cause this sound makes my vagina grow, uh-huh. uh, dry up. And, uh-huh. and, and she, she completely exactly. beat the hell out of those, uh, two, uh, two guys that were sitting at the table and they were, you know, timid and nice from that second on. But you see, women aren't putting up with that shit anymore. Yeah. You know, and I mean, and they should. I'm, I'm, you know, we're Gen X, man. I'm Gen X. I'll get riot girl on your ass. Mm. Okay. Like I grew up fighting in the East Texas trailer parks, man. Yeah. And I didn't enjoy it, <laughs> but <laughs> you know, I got my ass beat. Trust me, but I learned how to fight and like, I'm not afraid to kick somebody in the ball. Mm. You know, and, uh, and, and I've had more problems with men and aggressive behavior when they, when actually on a date than at work mm-hmm. where men are like, we're on a date, we're kicking it. And then all of a sudden they start getting aggressive and I'm like, nope, stop. We're done. Mm-hmm. You cannot grab my head and decide that you want to put my head somewhere and just think that's okay. That's yeah. That's rude. It's aggressive. And it's reason number 2,598 why I'm single. Right. Because I just, I don't deal with rude aggressive. You know, I'm a giver. I'm like, you missed out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I don't deal with takers. Right. Period. So I had more stuff that because work, I mean, we really, people can say whatever they want to say. And I mean, you know, and I'll say what I've got to say too. And sometimes what I have to say is, dude, you can suck my dick and I will grow one for you. <laughs> Water, sunshine, photosynthesis, penis. We'll do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, and it shuts them right up. Uh, see, a lot of these, uh, a lot of the bartenders and waitresses that I talk to on this show are usually tough as mm-hmm. nails, and I yeah. love, I love that. Um, yeah. But when you were thinking about some of these uh, uh, millennials that are uh, joining the workforce right now, they don't, mm-hmm. they don't know really what's going on, how the world works, yeah. and they either freeze up. And then run to social media to complain about it instead of doing something mm-hmm. about it. And, right. uh, you know, it's something that I'm hoping that people uh, our age will convey to them, no, put the phone down, do mm-hmm. something about it. And, right. yeah. you know, just complaining about I, it on I Twitter. Say, yeah. I'm working with a couple of Zenials. And I got to say... Um, I respect the hell out of these kids. Yeah. Like that, like the ones that I'm working with, um, they got a good work ethic. They show up. They're willing to, you know, pick up those extra shifts and stuff. They're willing to work for the money they have. Um, they're, they're totally honest. Um, when I had to go away recently, I made a post on, on my Facebook page just to let people know, like, I'm not going to be there, but these kids are, and they're awesome. And please support them. Mm. Um, and because I really, I really believe in them. And I really, as customers, I'm really liking a lot of the Zennials, um, as well, because a lot of them come from service industry families. Mm-hmm. Now, I think that what you're seeing with them, um, and I'm seeing with them too, is they're socially awkward as well, just like we were when we were getting started. Mm-hmm. It's just that um, their way of handling their social awkwardness and their way of communicating their feelings has become so tech-oriented. Right. 
Um, but I mean, they're just as awkward as you and I were back in the day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, we didn't have the tech to hide behind. I didn't have the tech to hide behind, but I tell you what, one of the reasons I was the, such a fast waitress was because I wanted my cigarette break. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I made sure everybody had every condiment and every side plate and every extra napkin in advance. So I could go have my bitch control stick. So did you uh, uh, work corporate at all? I did. I, I worked at Hard Rock Cafe, Dallas BBQ. Um, I worked at a couple of casinos that were big enough to be very corporate. Like mm. I had to pass a background check and pee in a jar to get there, which was rough. Because, yeah. you know, so. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, but I mean, it, they, it, but it was a native casino too. So everybody smoked. I don't think they really cared about that. Yeah, this because uh, in I found in corporate type of environments you don't really have mm-hmm. the you have the fifteen minute break you have your half hour lunch right. and you have a fifteen minute break right. those are your only times you go mm-hmm. out for a smoke mm-hmm. but uh, when in non corporate environments mm-hmm. the boss is a lot more lenient you know all the tables are taken care of I'll be about back and, well, <laughs> and well even in corporate environments though where the bosses are reasonable people who know they hired adults mm-hmm. who could take care of their business. They don't care. Like I, even whether I worked in a corporate place or not, if I wanted to have a cigarette break, my bosses knew that I wasn't going to play with my money. I wasn't going to try to take off if my customers weren't taken care of. And the rule was, uh, at least at Hard Rock Cafe, make sure somebody's looking over your table, let somebody know where you're going. And that's it. Like, you know, I think some, some people are smart enough to hire adults and realize (laughs) that they hired adults. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, but I've worked in so many places, too, where it wasn't even until Hard Rock where I even got um, lunch break yeah. or any sort of, like, real break. So the way I always felt with my cigarette breaks is I didn't get a 15-minute break. I didn't get a half-hour break. I get breaks to, to smoke and pee. That's it. I take five minutes to smoke or five minutes to, pee, five minutes to pee, and that's pretty much all I got. And I would take those breaks, and my customers were good and taken care of. Mm-hmm. Because I was entitled to those because Lord knows they certainly didn't give me time to eat. Yeah. That's the way it was in all the mom and pop joints that I ever worked at. Mm-hmm. I mean, you yeah, smoked. Well, even at IHOP. Yeah. Yeah. Even at IHOP back in the day. Cause I mean, I used to, I started off graveyards at IHOP and um, I was the only waitress. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I'd have a little table in the back where I could go smoke. Fortunately, I didn't have to go outside. Right. Now, that was a rough job, though. That was probably one of the jobs where it was the hardest because I was 19 years old. I looked like Snow White with an eyebrow ring. <laughs> <laughs> I had, like, the short black hair. I was pale. I had the poofy sleeves. And, the yeah, I looked like, like I'm like, I'm trying to 86 somebody. They're like, what are you going to do? Call the seven dwarfs? Mm. <laughs> like, they would literally laugh at me. Yeah. You know, it was, it was like, I had no manager there, too. I had to talk them into putting a phone in the back. So if I had to call 911. That I could, because there were times when the place was getting run, just overrun by people who were just like freaking out over shit. And, um, I, um, and I try to call 911 because I'm having people all dying and dash and all this other stuff. And I can't keep up with everyone because I'm outnumbered. And I'd have somebody standing behind me, behind the payphone, just like holding it down so I can't make the call. Mm. That's right. Yeah, that's scary. It was, it was pretty scary. Yeah. yeah. And so I was like, guys, you got to at least give me, I mean, I don't have management. I don't have anyone really having my back. It's me, the cook, and sometimes a bus boy. Um, give me a phone in the back, please. Mm. One uh, thing completely off topic that I want to hit real quick. You're a Doctor Who fan? Oh, hell yeah. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> hell yeah. Yeah, you... Uh... Absolutely. One of the first messages you sent me, you're a Whovian, and uh, oh, yes, so, I'm a total Whovian. So I, just, I love it. Well, I got back into it again when the, with David Tennant when they brought it back, brought it back with him because yeah. I mean I remember Tom Baker from when I was a kid. Yeah, Tom Baker was my favorite and, doctor, uh, but when I was right. a kid, uh, right? He's just very uh, funny and jovial. He's fun. And, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, he was very animated and. Uh, yeah, he was a great he was a great doctor for when we were kids. And so, uh, Tardis uh, all of a sudden dematerializes in the middle of your bar. Door opens up. Who do you want to see? Ooh, it's, it's a toss up between Jody and Tennant. Mm. Yeah, good. Well, it really, I, I really, I love them both so much uh, that it really is. It's it's really a toss up between them mm. for sure. Is it all all the How doctors? About you? But I'd also I also would love to meet River Song. Yes. It, <laughs> yeah. I would love like easily my favorite companion. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, 
about you? Uh, well, you know, I, I have to say, I would, I would cruise with David Tennant just because uh, he, yeah. uh, he was, uh, he was just cool, you know, and yeah, and not, it, but nerdy cool, nerdy like, cool, he's just, like that. total like nerdy chic. He's like the king of nerd chic. But uh, I did love that dude. When uh, I went back uh, after uh, after quite a few seasons had gone by, uh, I went back mm-hmm. and started with Christopher Eccleston, and I mm-hmm. thought he made a good doctor. Truthfully, yeah, and, and he proved himself to me within the first few second the his first few lines where. All of a uh-huh. sudden, he bursts through the door and says, "By the way, what's your name?" She, Rose Tyler. Hi, hi, Rose. I'm the doctor. Run for your life! And you know, and <laughs> and, yep. and uh, but they all. Uh, I thought he would have uh, made a great doctor too. But the uh, each one has their merit. My favorite, probably as of, of the current uh, run of Doctor Who, uh, from Cric- mm-hmm. Christopher Eccleston till today, is David yeah. Tennant. Uh, yeah. But I did enjoy matt smith he felt cartoony yeah, to me i loved him too him uh, and his little fez hat yeah because <laughs> fezes are cool i love the but, fez the fez is cool <laughs> but um i got my father to watch the uh watch doctor who and he's never watched doctor who even the classics uh ever in his oh, life yeah but he absolutely admires um uh after matt smith um uh I've completely blanked his name. Peter, oh. Peter Capaldi. Peter, yeah. My dad completely admired Peter, Peter yeah. Capaldi in his rendition and He of was the pretty cool, too. And yeah. all that, uh, the episode right after, uh, uh, because as companions, uh, I'm not counting River Song really as a companion since she's kind of half Time Lord, but... Uh, yeah, this is true. Fair. But Fair. as companions go, I really liked Clara. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, Clara Oswald. Uh, yeah, she was pretty, and she held the doctor at bay at most yeah. of the time. <laughs> and yeah, and she was fun. But <laughs> yeah, but I just had to bring that up. Uh, yeah, what I loved about Jody and her season is they really touched on some fun historical stuff, which is very timely considering a lot of the stuff that's going on right now. Mm-hmm. Um, but what I also loved about Jody was just. Uh, the way that she'd kind of do something and forget that she's a woman. Yeah. Like, oh, wait. Yeah. And like, she'd do something. She'd be like little, like an awkward sort of thing. and be like, Oh wait, hold on. <laughs> Adjusting. <laughs> oh, I'm a woman now. Okay. <laughs> yes. All right. That's it. Do you only own any st- sonic screwdrivers or. No. no, you didn't go that far. <laughs> no, I didn't go that far. I did buy one for one of my nephews, though. He was he was a Whovian. Mm. Which, and, which uh, doctors? Oh, he, he liked Matt. Okay, yeah. yeah Matt Smith it. had a like really he, cool sonic yeah. screwdriver. So. <laughs> and, and, he was, and he was also, he was really, really into the feds. Yeah. Um, the, the day of the doctor when Matt Smith, David Tennant, and John Hurt all came in playing the doctor, uh, I thought yeah. that episode was insanely epic. And yeah, uh, yeah, I just, we, I had to geek out with you for just a few seconds. <laughs> I love geeking out over shit like that. Like that's my shit. Like I was recently at a wedding and it was basically a geek wedding and you know, I was sitting at the Hobbit table and I was just like, why is there no doctor who table? <laughs> well, you know? And I mean, I was the best whatever. So I feel like I should have had to stay because it was my cousin. He got married and he comes to me and he's like, will you be the best whatever? And I was like, dude, I have always wanted to be the best, whatever. <laughs> Are you kidding? Like this was my goal in life mm-hmm. and I got to be the best, whatever. And then he tried to call me the best person. I'm like, no, I didn't agree to that. I agreed to be the best, whatever. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that was the agreement. You didn't do the Matt Smith wedding dance. <laughs> no, no, no. They didn't give me a, you know, I wasn't dancing. I, I was tired, man. Uh, Cause I work night. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and I had to get up at like seven o'clock in the morning when I normally go into bed. Yes. Love, oh. To go pick up my aunt and my uncle and then take them an hour away by Uber. <laughs> and, and I was glad to spend the time with them. I love them dearly. It's been way too long since I've seen them. But I was not awake. I was just like, I took like a two hour nap or some shit. Maybe I flopped around like a fish. I just couldn't. Because I mean, when I've got to 
flip flop my schedule. I get such anxiety about having to do that and having to get up early that I can't sleep. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I have, the, I have the same problem. Uh, there were many times where, uh, like I just bartended the night before we're about to, the family's about to go on vacation, but we're going to leave at five yeah. o'clock. I got home at four. Might as well mm. stay up. <laughs> you know? and, yeah. But, yeah. uh, so um, you got to do a doctor's appointment or something or whatever, and you just got to be there early. And yeah. the day world doesn't give a damn about us, yo. No, no <laughs> they have, they don't. They, they don't care. They're noisy. They want us to be places early. It's not fair. And uh, and so many people. Another very common server bartender question is, why don't you just go to bed earlier? I got off work at four a.m. <laughs> uh, it's you know. like you get off work at five, dude. Do you go home and go to bed at six? Yeah. No. And, of course not. And you need be, time to wind down. And be awake by two? <laughs> yeah. No. Nah. No. Nah. Uh, I need a little bit of time. But um, before we start the wrap up, I want you, I, I would like you to uh, uh, re-summarize the, uh, the drug, uh, the drug. Right. Uh, Fit check. Yeah. Well, uh, can you talk about that one more time before we close out? Yeah, this is so important. And honestly, like I, I knew I'd have fun talking to you and I've become such a fan of yours. Oh, um, but you. I mean, this is really the main reason why I wanted to do this show. And I really wanted to get in here before the poly party holidays. Uh, people, please check out fentcheck.org. F-E-N-T-C-H-E-C-K dot O-R-C. Um, also, try to carry Narcan at your bar. Keep at least two of them. In most states, Narcan is free. Sometimes you don't know what drugs people have done before they come in. So try to be ready. Um, I'm also personally planning on taking a CPR course. And I think it's a good idea if anyone can do that to do that as well. Any extra stuff that we can do to help protect our customers. Keep Narcan at your bar. Look into getting scent check strips. If you don't, if you can't get them from scentcheck.org, Look into what local harm reduction programs that you have, because there are other other organizations just like fentcheck.org that are also distributing fentanyl check strips. Um, but we really need to try to, you know, look after each other. Um, if you do drugs, please be careful of what you're doing. Please check your drugs. Uh, please make sure that you have somebody who is not on the drugs with you to spot you that way if you do overdose or something happens you've got somebody who knows what's going on and can get you to the hospital please 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 people be careful make it through the holiday season let's make it to 2022 and have a whole bunch of fun then okay perfect so if people want to get a hold of you uh or mm -hmm. see uh you know uh, follow you or find out more about you um where do they go i am geek punk 420 on Instagram. Geek it doesn't tell you anything about me. <laughs> I know I'm such a mystery. It tells you nothing about me. So mysterious. Mysterious woman of the world. At Geek Punk, oh, yes. Punk uh, 420. Okay, cool. Yep. Well, thank you so much for taking time, uh, time out to be on the show. I'm so happy that you listened to the show and uh, you wanted to be on the show. It, it, it makes me feel really good that somebody out there is uh, telling me they listen and uh, I can get them on the show. Oh, I listen to you while I'm putting on my face. Oh, really? I'm like putting on my mascara and shit, and I'm listening to Anthony. I'm like, what's up? <laughs> it gets me in the right mood, though, when I, before I go to work. And then the way you end it with, like, don't take any shit from anybody, and your little, like, sign-off. I love your sign-off so much. It just kind of sends me into the world with a nice positive message, feeling good about life, good about myself, and good about my customers. So thank you, and thank you for having me on the show, dude. You rock, and if anyone questions, whether you rock or not, you send them to Double Down Saloon, NY City, New York City, right? I'll pull out the whip, and I'll set them straight with the facts. You got that? Okay, people, you heard her. She, you know, if you have a problem with Hey Bartender Podcast, I'm sending you to her. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm the much. quality. You, well, I'm, go I, I'm the customer service for you. That's it. I'll be your customer service. Complaint department. Complaint department. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Thank you so much. All right, people, it is last call. Last call for alcohol. Come on up to the bar, get what you need, and drink it quick because I'm not staying open much longer. Special thanks to Bobby Jean Daniel for being on the show. It is always 
a great moment for me to have fans of the show to be on the show. If you are a fan of the show and you'd like to be on the show to talk about your service industry stories, all you have to do is email me, dude at heybartenderpodcast.com. Or you can contact me on any of the social medias, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. You can DM me. All of them are at Hey Bartender Podcast. And as always, I got to thank Laura Hope and the Arctones. Give you guys a shout out for letting me use your song as a theme song for my show. I can't believe how perfect it works with my show. And go pick up their album. Go check out Laura Hope and the Arctones. They're available for download on iTunes, Bandcamp.com. Go check them out. They've got a lot of great stuff. Finally, remember to go to www.heybartenderpodcast.com. Maybe check out some past episodes and check out the Hey Bartender Podcast swag I got on for sale in there. Uh, If you know a fan of Hey Bartender Podcast, go pick up a t-shirt. It'll make a great Christmas present or whatever. So thank you for listening to Hey Bartender Podcast. And as usual, I just want to wish you all lots of love, lots of sex, lots of happiness. And remember, don't take any shit from anyone. Good night. What do you mean it's last go? I just got here.